Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion, a podcast taking a deep dive into the fast-paced world of preprints. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers, discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. Hit that subscribe button, leave a rating and find us on Twitter at MotionPod. Support us by heading over to buymeacoffee.com slash preprints. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we have Ben Thomas from the ever sunny Edinburgh University. Join us for a chat about the sex and age dependencies of calorie restriction and open science. I take it to, to make the editing easy if I just kind of stumble over my words just to start oh, yeah. again. And, and yeah, become... um, John loves a good long pause between words as well. <laughs> Apparently, okay. I'm really, really bad when I'm thinking of a question. I pause for quite a while and I do that a lot, <laughs> it turns out. So he yeah. loves all yeah. of that. Um, he loves nothing more than sitting through and going really detailed to pick all the ums and ahs out. So the more ums you can put in there, the better. <laughs> nice. I'll make it as difficult as possible. We didn't challenge <laughs> He loves little Easter eggs when he's when he does the, the editing. So p- stick them in there. Let's see how good he is. Cool. Uh, cool. So I guess we'll start with one of your fun facts. I'm going to come back to you being a teacher a bit later on. So I'm going to start with your political board game because I don't think we've had anyone on yet who have created their own board game. I'll tell you what, I've got one. Let me just because I've got one just here, obviously. It's a bit of a messy room, so I do apologise. Thankfully, the podcast won't pick it up. <laughs> But if we leave that bit in, everyone's going to know now. Right, right. Um, oh, actually, I've got one of those effects on, so it's okay. <laughs> it's not going to show up if I hold it up. You've just completely become invisible. Well done. I, I try, I try. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's. it's on the website. So the the one that I sent you, I think I must have sent you guys. Yeah, um, I had a look through earlier, yeah. So yeah, effectively, we'd had some barbecue after the first lockdown was released. And the whole way through, we were just looking, we were watching the, the COVID briefings. And just it it didn't matter what the question was. The answer was always vaccines. Like and it it just got to the point it was ridiculous that the it didn't matter what problem was presented. The same thing, the same answers kept coming up. Yeah. And eventually I just kind of I think I was kind of explaining it to my girlfriend who she's Austrian, so she's used to a different style of politics. And I said, like it, it, they're just it's just a game to these people, like they're just enjoying it. And it's and then I thought, well, if it's just a game, I can play that game too. And I'm sure other people would like to, but um yeah, busted it out for a barbecue. And then a few people said, actually, like, you know, when you when you make it, can I, I say busted out, I kind of wrote it on bits of A4 paper. And, you know, when you fold it, you can't fold it eight times, but you can fold it seven. And then, um, and someone said, yeah, like a couple of people said, like, let me know when you've actually made them. So I, I kind of decided I'd that would be the project. Well, plug it. What's it called? Where can you buy it? We never get a plug thing, so this is exciting for us too. Oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, so it's called Spin Machine. Uh, if you go to witworks.co.uk, uh, it's currently down there for pre-order because they should be arriving, the rest of them should be arriving within the UK soon. If you are super quick, I do still have some of the advanced orders, so I can send those out. And I've been sending those out to people instead of just waiting for the sake of it. <laughs> but yes, yeah, Spin Machine, witworks.co.uk. Yeah, should be some nice new pictures going up soon as well. And I've, I've got some friends who are uh, improv comedians, obviously being in Edinburgh, there's lots of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that's coming up or should be is they volunteered to to play it on camera and then have kind of actual professional comedians playing it instead of just, you know, people. That over is here. that is going to be great, isn't it? <laughs> Fingers crossed, if, that, if it happens soon, we haven't recorded it yet, but if it happens soon, I can get it up online ASAP, and then people can watch that online as well. Well, there you go. We, we never get a plug thing, so there's a plug for something real that people can go and buy. It's quite exciting. Yeah. I, you're going to get like a bunch of board games you've designed, and they're just going to turn up at your house. It's... Well, we, we've got this one now. We've got one uh, very similar, a conspiracy theorist. So the idea, we haven't got to the full prototype of that. The idea you draw kind of four cards out of five piles or something like that. You you might get, for example, a person, a place, an objective. You've got to put your tinfoil hat on and come up with a mad conspiracy theory <laughs> with those things. And again, it's whoever does the best will win. So it's that 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 will be coming out probably another year or so. But yeah, this is our first one. Look at that, a future plug as well. Um, <laughs> now I I I want to keep talking board games, and I feel we could do that. But that's not this podcast. Maybe that's another podcast. Um, but <laughs> you are are you are you still a PhD student, or have you finished now? Yeah, I, I'm in that twilight zone where the funding's run out, but mm, I haven't yeah. submitted. So yeah. <laughs> that fun period. We all know that period. <laughs> um, so you're you're based up in Edinburgh, lovely city. Kind of that's where I want to move next. And we're mm. talking about a preprint you posted like really, really recently. Actually, I was quite on it this time. So could you just tell us a little bit about 
what the work was about and a broad overview of your rough findings. Yeah, it's, it's quite funny to hear you say really recently, because for us, it's four years late. We've, we've meant to write it. <laughs> and then we just kept adding data to it and adding data. Um, so effectively, so I work under Will Cawthorn, and he's really interested in bone marrow adipose tissue, um, which makes up somewhere around 10% of your adipose tissue. But because of where it is, it's quite hard to study. There's not a lot of papers on it. One of the things that does make it amplify is calorie restriction. So it's really strange to have a fat depot that actually increases when you restrict calories, because it, traditionally you think the opposite, that when you restrict calories, you get a lot thinner. Seeing this, you know, he's he's run males and females, I think back before the, the NIH introduced it and back before sex as a biological variable came about. But he ran males and females mostly just interested in the bone marrow. And then one of the machines we've got is a, a TDNMR. It can it just detects proton environments and it can tell you how much fat and fluid mass is in your mouse and lean mass. Anyway, we calorie restricted these mice, males and females, and it looked as if there was no um, loss of fat mass when you calorie restrict the females. It was this, the strangest thing. So we kind of, over the course of various studies, what we've ended up doing is kind of pulling together various studies to, to put this together. We've basically calorie restricted these male and female mice at, at this age, they're about nine weeks old at this age, calorie restricted them. And sure enough, the females just don't lose their fat when they calorie restrict, or they lose such a tiny amount, but they proportionally maintain it. They, they're really, really hungry for this fat. We've then done kind of glucose tolerance tests and some and run an insulin analyzer on that. And what we see is that the females don't really, they, they get like a minor improvement, the females, but nothing compared to the huge improvement that these males get. Like it's, it's quite stark. And we haven't seen any improvement in insulin sensitivity. It's all just the same. We ask the obvious question then, if if they're getting a lot more glucose tolerant, you know, where what's the, the source of that? Is the glucose getting deposited much better or is it just that it's not being produced so much in the first place? So we, we ran PET-CT. We did a, a glucose tracer, an 18 fluoro tagged glucose and, and, and injected it into the mice. And when we do that, we don't really see any better glucose uptake. Like there there's might be a slight trend in some of the fat masses and and some organs you kind of see, the heart, you see a little bit of difference in the brain, but not enough to explain the, the big stark difference that we saw on the glucose tolerance test. So we're kind of concluding from that, that it's mostly towards, mostly to do with um, the fasting glucose in the first place and effects on the liver. We thought we'd follow that up. The first thing we said was actually, we see this in these young mice, but of course we feed the mice based on human time, but mice are the nocturnal. So we were feeding them at nine in the morning because that's the easiest time to do it. So we repeated it all again in a bunch of mice fed at 6 p.m. And we still saw the sex difference. There was some very minor differences, but it didn't. It, the, the females holding on to their fat was still there. And then we thought, well, also, this is the case in young mice. But we, we looked at some of the human literature. Unfortunately, in the paper, it's done literature review first and then moving on to our experiments and stuff like that. Um, but we looked through the literature and what we could see was that there's, there's very, very few studies in mice and humans that use males and females and describe the data separately. It's like there's something like three and a half thousand studies that came up in our search. And goodness, it must have been somewhere around 30 studies in humans and 40 studies. And I, I, I should probably check the numbers before I say I think it's something about 50 studies in both of them, but a, a vanishingly small amount. When you look in those, there is some suggestion of sex differences. And interestingly, in humans, if you just look at the actual studies that, that don't report a sex difference, in mice, they're all in old mice. And in humans, they're all in either really young humans or a few of them are in old humans. So it made us think that age is somewhat involved. Um, so, of course, we just did everything again. And we ran it all with an 18-month-old cohort of mice. And in those that don't see the sex difference, the females are happy to lose their fat. It's, again, just the strangest thing. So we, after that, we've kind of run a, a bunch of PCRs and a bunch of uh, ceramide mass spec to try and just get just a little idea of what's going on in the liver. Because, again, the, the liver is what we've implicated so far. And we've just kind of rounded it off with our suggestions on what we think it is. So we've, we've there's a lot of really good reasons to think that it's related to estrogen and that it would be abolished with overectomy. We'd actually, we're running those experiments now, either for a follow-up paper or because we're expecting the reviewers to have a go at us and, and we'd need to include it. But um, we're, we're running those experiments now um, for the sake of certainty. And it actually doesn't it looks as if they're two separate things. The first thing we thought was that there's this one unifying mechanism. The females are holding on to their fat, which is, again, why we thought maybe they're taking the glucose up so regularly. Actually, when you over them, the data is a bit more nuanced than we were hoping for. But the one thing that we're getting the impression of is that it is two separate things underlying it, if not more. 
that's probably the safest way of putting it so it doesn't yeah <laughs> i mean it was it's probably it's one of those things where it was always going to be complex i suspect because it is i mean i've i've been waiting for a really good calorie restriction preprint to appear for a few months now because i think it's one of those things where you can talk quite broadly but also get into specifics and it's, it's accessible so it's, it's good for a podcast and when yours popped up you know you're not only obviously you've got the calorie restriction in there but you're also looking at uh, you're looking across sort of mice and humans you've got the sex difference thing which nobody looks at so what it was I, I kind of get where, you, where you're saying where it's this thing where you just kind of kept adding data to it and you, you've kept building this, this massive paper out. But it, I mean, it, it's a really good paper. So it, obviously you should be very proud of that. Um, and it, it looks like it's going to find a home in a pretty good journal as well. Keeping fingers crossed, yeah. It was. It's one of these these blessings is that we because we've pulled it across lots of different studies. Again, because we're interested in bone marrow, we've got lots of um, knockout mice for this experiment or that mm. experiment. All of that data is going into other papers that are currently being written. But all the wild types of that could be pulled into this. And it's. I mean, it's it's the first time. I've seen a mouse paper that's got numbers big enough you could actually do a Z test and not just a T <laughs> test. So I'm, I, I don't think we've done that. I think uh, uh, you know the, our stats are all there, so it's okay. But it was it was just really nice to see the combined effort of everyone in the lab could put all of this together. Mm. The first step of it is almost a recycled paper, if that makes sense. It, I mean, yeah. it's not in the sense that we were directly looking into it and that's what we were doing. But I think I must have had ends of maybe eight or ten in the groups that I ran directly. But then when you pull everyone together, you do see there is the effect there. It's quite nice. Mm. So let's take a, a step back and let's talk about what calorie restriction is and how it's maintained or how you maintain it in the lab. So I, I had COVID towards the end of last year and that gave me a calorie restriction. It was great. I lost so much weight. <laughs> Horribly at the same time, but lost so much weight. So, you know, in a lab setting, how, how what do you class as calorie restriction in a mouse? Because I, 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 I mean, I work with mice and I have no idea what their normal calorific intake is uh, and how do you maintain it so i mean really strictly calorie restriction in the in the most simplest definition it's reducing your caloric intake without malnutrition that's got to be absolutely key there's a lot of older papers even some more modern papers as you read them they've calorie restricted their mice but actually either they're deficient in various micronutrients because they haven't given them equal levels in the diets mm. or the other one that that you see quite a lot but you have to dig into is what they do when they calorie restrict is they end up just taking one micronutrient or macronutrient and restricting that. So you might read a calorie restriction study, but actually it's a carb restriction study or a protein restriction study because that's how they've taken it out of the diets. It, everyone's got a slightly different method, but it's all rooted in the same start. What we just do is we single house them and we weigh their diet every day for a week. And that gives us an idea of their daily intake. That part is then pretty rock solid between people. What you do next and this is again one of the the ups and downs of, their, of the calorie restriction field everyone's got a different follow-on so for us we've we know how much food they're eating we've got a separate diet and we weigh out 70 percent of that diet and that's what the cr mice get the two diets that they have the, the one of which you only give 70 percent that's got enriched micronutrients so that the only difference at the at that weight, the only difference is the total number of calories. The, the macros are the same. The micronutrients are the same. It's just, you know, vitamins and minerals, all the same. The only difference is the calories. Some people for calorie restriction, what they'll end up doing is actually an alternate day fast. And so they'll, they'll give the mice their food for the day and then they'll take it away for a day and they'll repeat it like that. Additionally, I, I gave you the number 70%. That would be a 30% reduction in calories. There's also 40%, and that's very common. Like a lot of papers uh, will do 40% calorie restriction. There's a question of if that's too severe a calorie mm. restriction. There's one paper, I, I won't mention the paper in question, but one of the things in my PhD, there was one paper that found actually detrimental effects when you calorie restrict at 40%. And so my first question was, well, is that the case at 30% as well? And we don't see any change at all. It, it kind of adds to the idea that maybe 40% is a bit too severe. Mm. The other thing is for us, we feed them at 9 a.m. And that's just because I can come in and do that and then have the rest of the day in front of me for whatever else needs to happen. It also means that we so we'll also dissect very close to when they're fed so that you get minimal kind of circadian effects based on that. But you get all these strange things so that the mice will become hyperactive maybe an hour before they're due to be fed. 
and so then then part of the worry is well is what we're seeing actually an exercise effect because they're all running around there'll also be a lot more stress than the ad lib mice so then you've got you have to worry about stress effects and there's all these different bits and bobs that frustratingly get in the way yeah i've been doing some circadian rhythm work lately and we don't have a light dark room so i have to work to real hours oh. And it's, oh, it's an awful it's a miserable existence so 9 a.m would be great <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a nightmare uh, i'm in at all hours that's, yeah we've had a few where uh, it's like two o'clock in the morning to do so thankfully i've stopped that now because i'm sick of coming in a, a, the early hours of them. that's what you get a master's student for that's what they can do i know i know we haven't, it's a bit it's where we've gone wrong it's what we need so you've you've defined this as a 70 percent reduction and i think it's really good that you raised the point that you're reducing calories not the other macronutrients because that's one of the things i would have assumed is a big issue in this field is that people are probably actually not doing that and there's a lot of mm-hmm. knock-on effects you've said a lot more knock-on effects than i thought there would have been it does sound like it's a more complex yeah sorry if i go too much into it there was one paper i think it was solomon b day 2014 and they looked at various macronutrient compositions and lifespan extension and one of the things that they found was that both a high protein and a low protein diet extends lifespan. And there's all, and this, uh, similar things you find with carbohydrate as well, both high carb and low carb. So it's, it's one of these really strange things where no one really knows what the answer is. And yeah. all you can yeah. ever do is, is caveat what you do. Yeah. So one of the other questions I had, again, broad strokes at the moment, is in the mice we use at least, they get very, very fat. And my understanding of mouse work is that's pretty common, is if you house a mouse in a lab environment, they tend to get fat and slow which is great when you've got to catch them because they're fast little buggers. Yeah. Um, and when they get fat and slow, they're a lot easier to catch. <laughs> so are your control animals on the normal sort of mouse diet or have you designed a diet that is specific for this kind of work where the control mice are actually healthy? Because I would not call most lab mouse diets healthy. It is So again, it depends on your strain. We use black six ends. Mm. Um, they're kind of, I mean, as you know, they're kind of used in metabolic research bec- precisely because they get a little bit metabolically unhealthy. There is, of course, there's always that question of what makes an adequate control, because there's no there's no species where you're in a fed state 24 hours a day for your entire life. It's tough. What we do. So what we do for the diet for these guys specifically, we've there's never a perfect experiment. And as much as we try to design one, you always end up with some flaw or another. If we had designed what we would argue would be like the, the perfect kind of control group for the ad libs, there's nothing in the literature you can ever compare it to. But do you know what I mean? Because it's, it's never actually yeah. been done. In the way that you stand on the shoulders of giants, all, all you can ever do is look at the work of the people that have come before you and try to add to it. Um, for our diets, for the ad libs specifically, we have to use a specific diet. We didn't design it. It comes from, I think it's research diets that we use. It, it the, de- the details are definitely in the method section. But we have to use two specific diets, the ad lib and the CR, because as I mentioned, the, the CR, they have to be equal macronutrients, micronutrients, mm. and um, vitamins, minerals, all these things at a reduced weight of it. The, the real frustration, actually, you really get a lot more variability in male mice and female mice. It's it's quite frustrating, but you just tend to get not, not just body mass size, but food intake and things like this. The reason for it isn't quite certain, but for the mice in this paper, most of them have eaten somewhere around 3.4, 3.5 grams of our diet. So we can reliably put them on a, on a better calorie restricted diet. The problem is depending on your cohort and depending on sometimes what your intervention is before they start this, that can influence how much diet they intake. Yeah. And it then means you can sometimes run some cohorts of mice and you've got later cohorts, but you can't, it's not a valid comparison between them because they've eaten different amounts the whole time um, yeah mouse variability is the bane of my life it's <laughs> it's just and, and we only use male mice because of the, the model we use but it's just it's ridiculous how many mice you need to use sometimes to get something that is significant or a, a change you can actually see and a lot of them like to not do anything i know that's and, and sometimes they just decide not to make it easy yeah you i mean so you, you obviously you try to use as few as you possibly can and one of the we obviously start with the first thing we do is a massive raft of power calculations to try and work out just precisely how much mice you can use, um, or rather how much you you must use, or how much beyond which it's kind of surplus to what you're looking at. The real problem is all of, or the problem I find with, all of the power calculations you do are either going to be based on your own data or on published data. And published data is disproportionately likely to be positive it's you know you see it you see the opposite in in the fields of psychiatry or psychology where they now do kind of uh, they do what's it called 
when you when you get approval to publish before it's actually been uh, pre-registered reports. So you, you see it in, in fields of pre-registered reports. Obviously, you, you, that's starting to disappear now. But we've had to do all of these based on published data, which, of course, there's the clear bias that, the as we say, that the positive results get published. So we actually we did our power calculations and did all of our mice. It was okay for the young mice where you can just run them, you know, as you have more litters, you can keep running them. When it comes to the older mice, again, there's no perfect experiment. So you, you do your power calculations as best you can. But once you once you find out actually you're, you're one or two mice short for one or two of the things that you need, you can't suddenly magic up another 18 month old mouse. Like, it, you know, they, they just don't come out of nowhere. So it's, as we say, hopefully, as you start getting some pre-reg reports published, you get better data to do power calculations on. Yeah. I mean, we're, moving, we're, well, we're trying to move towards that in the biosciences. It's not particularly taking off well, but you know, it's one of the things that ASAP Bio are trying to encourage. So yeah, one of the, you said, you know, you, you wrote the paper slightly differently to how it was performed. So the, the first figure in the paper is that sort of literature review and looking at the differences between the human and mouse literature for, for sex differences. Mm. And it was interesting to see that, I think it was something like 60% of the mouse papers were all using male mice, whereas about 60% of the human papers were using male and females. Why Why do you think there's that difference between the two species? So I know with I know in mice, one of the biggest reasons is there was this fear from back in, I think it was the 70s, this fear that the estrus cycle is going to complicate some of your glucose data. And as a result, people started using male mice just to exclude the possibility of that. Hmm. And then just as we said earlier, you do an experiment based on people who've come before you. So you, if someone has used male mice, the safest thing to do is to keep using it. More recently, it's been disproven that, that you get estrocycle induced variability, that that's any more than the natural variability within male mice, because they seem to vary a lot more with, yeah. with all these different things. But it's, it's one of these things, once it begins and the culture kind of sets, it, that's just it. And science is the weirdest thing where every individual scientist likes, likes to believe that they think very liberally and creatively, but science as a field is fantastically conservative and just wants to do exactly the same thing with very minor variations every time. With the humans, I, I, I'm not quite sure with the humans. I had this first kind of, I wouldn't even call it a hypothesis, but a guess that if someone approaches you with a potential weight loss trial, that you're kind of very happy to, you know, anyone would be very happy to go for it. But I, I know males are generally stupider than females when it comes to risk and things like this. So it might not be that females aren't, it might not be that males are disproportionately volunteering for other studies, but maybe females are a lot more sensible and are able to say, you know what, that doesn't sound like me, but something like a calorie restriction study might be really e simple and easy to do and, and hard for people to say no to. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that are in the po sort of popular media a lot. Actually, mm -hmm. I mean, Michael Mosley's on TV every week talking about calorie restrictions uh, and the 5-2 diet. Not that I'm plugging his, I'm not plugging his boots. He can do it himself. <laughs> That's two plugs in one podcast. <sighs> We'll mention Twitter. Oh, well, I've just done it now. But we'll mention Twitter at some point and give them a free plug too. Um, that happens it, it, every it show. Catches, it, it does catch people's attention though. It, it's also mm. the idea of something that you could do directly or you're somewhat involved with. Mm. And I, I remember telling my mum and explaining to her that like, she, she she's not a scientist, but she had some background understanding of science. And I said to her like, oh, you know, when females calorie restrict, they actually hold on to their fat mass. I knew it. I've known that for years. That's, you know, it's not me. It's, it's not the diet. It's me. And oh, I'm not going to get involved, mum. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lab down. So we all, the podcast team, all did our PhDs at Sheffield. And there was a lab down the corridor from where I was based there that worked on uh, calorie restriction in fruit flies. And the guy gave a talk once. And one of the really fascinating thing about this talk was basically the fruit flies on a calorie restriction diet, they live much longer than normal flies. So that's, it's one of the benefits of calorie restriction. That is, I think, is relatively well known about. I might be talking utter nonsense. But at least in fruit flies, it extends the lifespan. But they showed that as soon as you stop the calorie restriction, you give them a normal diet again, it, it kind of kills them all. And like just most of the flies just drop off. And there was no, at, at the time, I don't think it was particularly known why that was. I, mm. I assume you don't see that in mice? Or maybe so nobody's looked at it. You don't so much see that in, in mice that when you return the calories, it, it goes back mm. to it kind of, they, they don't like that. Um, it's interesting you mentioned flies because there's a, a PI at King's Building, which is also at Edinburgh, Jenny Reagan, and she does calorie restriction in flies. Yeah, as well. Jenny does. Jenny's work's amazing. I'll happily plug Jenny's work. She's, oh, she's excellent. Yeah, she's really clever as well. It's really nice to hear her talk. She, uh, so she's on my thesis committee. So I was showing her all these, uh, these various data. One of the things that's not in the paper, but that we collected was the 
gut length in mice. Um, mm. what, what, again, is canonically known is that when you calorie restrict, your gut length gets longer, um, propor proportional to your body size and things, which is not the case in females. There's just no change at all. And I was explaining that to her at the, th at the kind of yearly committee meeting. And she said, that's really interesting because in flies, she, I don't want to misquote her, but she effectively sees the opposite, that the effect she sees is in female only and not in her male flies. It's to do with gut length. I think she also sees things in like immune status and things like that. But I, I, I don't want to misquote her, so I won't go too much into that. But in the flies, you see, you seem to see the opposite, that it's the females that get this great big result and not the males. And I've, I've got a rough hypothesis why, but I'm never going to get the funding to do it frustratingly. So I'm, I'm, we've just got to see what happens. That, that's science life, isn't it? You'll come up with good ideas, but nobody wants to give you the money. Yeah, yeah it's my, my life as well. Um, so you've already kind of alluded to this when you were describing what you did in the paper but why do you think you see these differences between the sexes you mentioned estrogen is one of those things that you keep coming back to in the, the preprint mm. so in terms of a why there's there's a kind of there's a mechanistic question of why and there's also a kind of deeper more profound why are we all here kind of question of why the mechanistic we have thought it was estrogen and as i say the new data that we're collecting at the moment it suggests at very least it's at very least it's not just estrogen yeah. if that makes sense at the very least it's something else and at very least um these are two separate things the glucose tolerance insulin sensitivity and the fat mass retention in terms of the kind of wider reason of why it's happened there's two real reasons that I can think of. Um, based in, in a, in a Della Torre paper in 2016, I think, she took just males and females, and all she did was fast them for six hours. Not, not as the whole paper, but as part of her paper. Um, and what she saw was that the males, when they calorie restrict, they instantly clamp down on amino acid metabolism in the liver, whereas the females are just constantly metabolizing amino acids, whether they're fasted or not. And it makes me think there's this protein sparing kind of phenotype in males, whereas in females, they're happy to sacrifice protein. With that in mind, there's the, the two reasons I think it is. The first I think is male driven. I think that males kind of sacrifice a bit of metabolic health for the sake of, if you look at the bodybuilding literature, insulin is a huge driver of growth and, and insulin like growth factor. I think that males sacrifice a bit of health for the sake of size. And incidentally, I think that's why Jenny Reagan sees the opposite in her flies, because males are the, lar are the females are the larger of the species. Yeah. So I, I've, I have this loose hypothesis, that's a reason. But as I say, we're now realizing it's two separate things. The second reason I think is that, and again, it's related to the discussion of the De La Torre made, um, just caveating that these aren't my ideas, I'm, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I can't take credit for them. The second reason is that females, it, like evolutionarily, if you if there's a shortage of calories in any kind of given space, that's not the end of the world for males. You can just sacrifice some fat until you keep going. For females, you need to hold on to fat anyway for reproduction. It's 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 one of you know as you know if you get too low body fat, then kind of the menstrual cycle stops and everything. Body fat is one of the big kind of regulators or triggers of reproductive function. And as a result, what you don't want to do in, for argument's sake, a short-term calorie challenge, you don't want to sacrifice your reproductive function just for the sake of what could only turn out to be a day or two or, or however long it is. And as a result, the females, I, I would argue, would hold on to that fat for the sake of kind of maintaining reproduction. Interest, so John Speakman, who does calorie restriction in Aberdeen, he's one of the big names in the field. He has done a whole bunch of calorie restriction. And one of the things he's weighed is the seminiferous vesicles in male mice. And he's also weighed the testes in male mice. Separately, we've weighed the ovaries and the uteri in female mice. The, uter the, the ovaries and the testes in both mice don't have any difference in mass when they calorie restrict. But both the uteri and John's seminiferous vesicles do restrict. They, they atrophy when they calorie restrict. And it gives us this kind of hypothesis that when they're calorie restricting, the capacity for reproduction, so the ovaries and the testes, are maintained because they're paramount. But the short-term capacity, so the seminiferous vesicles and the uteri, they restrict when they calorie restrict. And, and again, it gives us this idea that it's, it's kind of clamping down on short-term reproductive function just for the sake of, uh, of, of maintaining it in the future and to try and buff this calorie challenge. As I say, that, that, so that's not what's in the paper. That's what we're kind of following on with extra mm. studies and, and what we're kind of designing around. But yeah, females hold on to their fat really readily. And if you take postmenopausal women or if you take overectomized female mice, they will lose fat when they calorie restrict. 
the little asterisk to that is that it's not just estrogen. There's something else involved and we're still collecting the data on that. But th there seems to be this massive tie in with reproductive function that seems to at very least be involved, if not kind of dominate some of what we're seeing. Sorry, I just keep rambling. Just tell you, me Well, to... you answered my next question in that. So you're just making my life even easier. Um, I mean, those two, those, it seems like a very logical, ex well, both those seem like logical explanations as to what might actually be going on. So I, I, we look forward to seeing that coming out. <laughs> I mean, as I say, we, it, it might end up as a final panel, mm. in, the panel uh, in this paper, depending on what the review was asked for. The only potential reason it might not is, as I say, it looks as if estrogen isn't the only thing implicated. And so what I wouldn't want to do is tack on a panel that doesn't actually answer any questions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, 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 that would be better for a follow on. Yeah. So oh, I have so many more questions. So we haven't even touched upon any of the human work in this study. So I'm, another question for the scientists this time. So because you've looked at sex differences, is this something you think we should be doing a lot more of in science? I mean, my work is just that we have to use males uh, because of the techniques we use. But a lot of studies will always just go down the male route. And mm. we're seeing this a lot in the, the mainstream media at the moment with relation to things like heart health and heart attacks. So there seems, I think there must be a campaign going on about um, the science for females having a heart attack because that's come up. I've noticed that a lot lately. Um, but of course, this is all rooted in the fact that science and medicine in particular is very rooted in a, well, it's rooted in a lot of sexism and it's very male orientated. So obviously we should be thinking about that, but what can we do to think about that more? So there's a, there's a very pedantic answer I'll give, but um, just before I do that, you, you mentioned, of course, that people mostly use male. Uh, we mostly use males and it's i guess it tacks on to what we were saying earlier about the estrus cycle mm. um males get more metabolically unhealthy and as a or, or generally speaking the males will become more metabolically unhealthy in an ad-lib animal and as a result if you're doing an intervention to try and test whatever you're doing you need fewer mice to see because there's going to be a greater effect size mm. or you would imagine there's greater effect size whereas females you would need more and again if you chat to a lot of people who are actively doing lots of metabolic research the answer they will give is that males get really metabolically unhealthy. That's not a reason not to do females, but it, you know, for argument's sake, if, if we were really, let's just imagine that academia has limited resources. I know it's hard to believe, but if we just pretend that we, we're not fantastically well-funded, you can test something in a, in a group that gives you a really big effect size, it halves the amount of work that you need to do. At very least for pilot data, it's very tempting and very understanding. Additionally, if you've managed to, if you've done an experiment to show that there's no difference, there's no sex difference in your thing, it's harder to justify still doing both sexes, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. A lot of people will try, will do one preliminary experiment, show there's no sex difference, and then continue on a string of different interventions but they haven't shown that any of those don't have a sex difference, which is additionally what you see as an excuse for people who more recently do calorie restriction. They argue that the very first thing they've done, they see no sex difference. And so they just use males and only then they do calorie restriction. And it's like, well, you've, you've stopped yourself from seeing it, if, if that mm. makes sense. In terms of the really pedantic answer that I mentioned, I would argue, and I definitely, I definitely think there's opinions can vary on it. I would argue not that people should be looking specifically for sex differences, but that people should be including females. The reason I say it's pedantic and the reason I say it like that is it will determine what statistics you use and also what your experimental setup will be. I think if you're specifically looking, if you've got a reason to, that's fine. But I think if you're specifically looking for sex differences, I think that's a different experiment than if you're looking, for example, if drug A will have an effect in males and females. I fully 100% agree and support the idea that people should be looking, should be including females a lot more. I tried explaining to my brother, like, females pay half the tax. Like, they've got half the reason that this research should support them. Do you know what I mean? I mean, females make up 50% of society, and yet the majority of research is done on and inadvertently for males. And that's mm -hmm. not because anyone has decided, there's not like a, a shadowy cabal of people who are deciding this will be hilarious. So let's just make life even harder for women. But instead <laughs> it's, it's easier, it's cheaper. You see greater effect sizes. It's understandable, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that very much gets at one of the things you said in the little form we get if you want to, to fill out, which is that we really need to think about overhauling the incentive system because, you know, I mean, science is done so that we can benefit our careers ultimately because otherwise a lot of things would be different and would be done different. And like this kind of thing where you would not go the easy route of just going, well, males give us a bigger effect, so we'll use those. Um, mm. You would actually be more thorough about it, I think, 
people would be more thorough about it. So, you know, obviously the, the, the main incentive in science is publishing. Get a paper out, get it in, sell nature science, and you've got a job for life, which is still unfortunately true for a lot of people in sciences. Mm. And it really shouldn't be, but it still is currently the way it is. So if you had one thing, you, you've, you've been granted a, an amazing power, and you can change one thing about science and the incentives, what is it that you think you would change? That is a very good question. Um, I haven't got an answer to this either. That was just, I came up with that on the spot. <laughs> so to, to check specifically the incentives, what would I change? Yes. Okay. I would much more rigorously and thoroughly and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I would make the, the Dora recommendations the absolute 10 out of 10. So to give another, to give an explanation why. So I mentioned before that my PI does lots of bone marrow adipose tissue stuff. It's a dramatically small field. There's there's absolutely minuscule number of papers compared to other adipose or mm. other fields mm. of research in general. What that necessarily means is that if you publish a paper on bone marrow adipose tissue, there's a smaller number of people who can cite that paper because there are a smaller number of people working in the field. If I was just... If, if I just had access to some huge amount of data and I was just churning out epidemiology every week, the first, first line of any paper, first reference, is always some epidemiology to, to frame the question. That doesn't mean that the epi that epidemiologist necessarily has produced better science. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what I mean? But it's much, more, it's much easier to get lots of citations. Additionally, if, if I was putting some various blood pressure papers out, or if I was putting lots of cardiovascular papers out, incidentally, that is what I'm also working on on the side. But that's a much larger field. You're again, you, you've got a much grander pool of people to potentially cite your work, a much grander audience, and all these different things. Smaller things, people are even there's a lot more connectivity, and it's easier to kind of snowball when there's so many people. It's easier to share that work around because all you need is one person to to like it, share it, whatever it is. What I would love is for research to be judged, just as the Dora principles kind of mandate for research to be judged on the quality of the research on how people have approached their question and how rationally they've interpreted as well as you know what what is their favorite uh, or what is their method of choice and things like that it's just such a source of frustration when you see a, a, what is actually sometimes the papers is even quite good as well you see some really good papers with huge number of citations you see some equally good papers with minuscule number of citations and it doesn't make the groups any better or worse than each other it just makes one paper more referenced or more popular than the other one i think that combined with the changing to the way that science is actually funded in the uk i think that would make a big difference I, mm. my partner's moved to switzerland to start a postdoc and the system they have there is once you're a PI, you will get funding for, for argument's sake, a PhD student, a postdoc, and a tech every year, something like that. Yeah. It, it might not be as specific as that, but you have a certain funding that's guaranteed to you. And when you're not trying, when you've got that funding guaranteed, you can do science for the sake of doing science and not because you're trying to tick boxes and and just sprinting just to stay in place yeah. my pi is one of the I've, I've, i'm very lucky i've got a very supportive and very kind of wise for his years pi and one of the things that he's he absolutely sticks to is that the people that are in academic science are here because they want to be you don't have to force them to do work they they love what they do like people really want to do this job i love what i do and as a result there's of the various different kind of bossing styles or management styles he is completely free to, to let people get on with whatever they want to do. Because unlike in some other industries or with different incentives, people really want to do the work here. So I, yeah, I, if we had a different funding structure where, you, where you're not obliged to, to sprint just to remain in place, let alone get ahead of you, I'd support that. Yeah. I mean, people really wanting to do their job and loving it as you have to in science also comes back to bite us as all the recent strikes in the UK are showing very clearly um because it does mean we just we like what we do so we'll work for free we'll do well we'll take on about three other jobs worth of work just because we like it and it, it makes things work along it's a system that it's really good at taking advantage of people yes. who want to be there and additionally there's there's also this kind of bias that if you're someone who's always volunteered to do work and always wanted to work hard you're, I would argue you're disproportionately likely to have made it into a position in academia mm -hmm. because you've had, for argument's sake, a strong CV the whole time. You've you've worked your way forward. 
lots of different experience but it's just yeah i i would love to see a change where a, a, someone i can't remember who it was but someone had tweeted the other day and said just imagine a job where you actually do academic science and nothing else <laughs> like and it's, i saw and that tweet <laughs> it would be that's the dream i'm glad you mentioned dora because it, it's a nice segue into preprinting because obviously with a preprint you don't have that journal name you you have to approach the work with the scepticism you should be approaching any bit of scientific output but for argument's sake with more scepticism um and so you you're assessing the work as you read it which i think a lot of people forget to do when they're reading a published paper so one of the things we ask everyone we have on the show unless i forget like i did last time is why did you or whose decision was it to preprint, and how have you found that process uh collective between myself will the lead author and carla so will has always been into uh, op more open science or kind of the principles behind good science and through him i started the edinburgh open research initiative i've passed it on now to the the next generation but what we do is advocate as well as share resources and kind of all these different things for open science principles and and, and all of these things I gave a presentation to some new PhD students last year or the year before. And there was one, what I'll do is I'll find the presentation and send it to you guys because it's got specific numbers and references and things. One of the things was that there's, there's no data for the number of papers that are, that go to first journals and get rejected and go to second mm. journals and get rejected. The only data is there for journals that the papers go to their final journal and finally get published. And the average time for that is somewhere around 145 days and the caveat is that of that is that it will be field dependent and things like that. But if you just look at all of the all of science or all of bioscience, it's around 140 days. So like four or five months odd. So this would be a way to get the data to get data out there really quick to let other people see it. And in doing so, you can get some feedback from people who see it and can say to you like, oh, you, you know, you've missed this or you, you've forgotten this or or I like how you've analyzed that. Have you also done this to it? Yeah. And funny enough, as I say, I was, I was giving this talk and someone, and they came to the questions uh, and someone said like, effectively to kind of paraphrase what they were, what they were getting across, especially if you're a younger scientist, you don't necessarily want to put out work out there to get ripped apart and that you can end up feeling really embarrassed. And my answer to that was that actually counterintuitively, that is what you want. You want to have your work absolutely shredded because that's that is the mark of I would argue a good scientist is someone mm. who they try to find flaws in what they do, and I think there's sometimes people can let the fear of embarrassment overcome their desire to do good science. As we say, everyone is here because they want to be. Like people want to do good science, and I think sometimes if you kind of open yourself up, which doing a preprint does, it lets people have a look and say like actually you know this looks a bit underpowered to me or this you know i disagree with this or something like that by being able to put yourself out there and say like look this is what i've done i think that that is the that is a good scientist quality um, and we had some master students and undergrads in the lab that we were we were trying to get this across to that it, it is more about you just need to swallow your pride and like the the dream is for someone to say like yeah you've done these things wrong because then you can do it better but if instead you publish it and only afterwards someone says oh you've done these things wrong it's too late that's been published unless you retract it and republish it or go down the Nobel prize winning route and just double down <laughs> and admit that you are correct all of the time and couldn't possibly be wrong. You know what? I will, I'm willing to sacrifice my future Nobel Prize if it gets more people pre-printing. <laughs> no, I think I I've given up any chance I have of one. Um, <laughs> but I think part of that, it, it kind of, it also feeds into the incentive system, I think, a little bit. Because I think, and this is that sort of reluctance to have your work torn apart, is if somebody does that, then it you've got more work to do. And it's going to take you longer to publish. And so it kind of... I think some people see that as damaging to their careers yeah. and their career being they just need to publish, which is not, it's not what a scientist is. It's not what a scientist is meant to be. <laughs> no, yeah, I agree. I, th I think it also doesn't help, again, depending on what field you're in. I my, my, as I say, for the old mice, it would have taken a minimum of 18 months um, plus the time to actually run the experiment. It would take the best part of two years if I had to do something differently or if I'd done something wrong. Counter to that, I've got a friend who works on E. coli. She can come up with an experiment run it and analyze it all in the same day you know so in her case there's no there's no downside if someone says you've done something wrong she can redo it in a day and have it all reanalyzed and written back up 
I definitely understand the fear if you've got lots on and if you're very junior. My very first presentation I gave to my department, God, I think I was, what, six months into the PhD? It's, it's nerve wracking. And you're presenting data to these people who are phenomenally intelligent. And I found myself, I did that thing that a lot of people do early on and they kind of learn their way out of where questions came at me. And instead of admitting I don't know the answer, I was kind of trying to dance around it or try and point them somewhere else. And at the time, I, you know, I wish I'd done differently, but also now I've learned it's better to just say, I don't know, or or it's better to just say like, we haven't, we haven't done that analysis or better to say like, we can redo that experiment. But when you're still in that defensive mindset that you're somehow almost being attacked, even though that's certainly not the case, Hmm. you know, I understand it. Like I, I definitely did it. For, for months and months and months and only because I had a really good PI who was kind of encouraging me to think you know that you're you're not being attacked people are trying to make your science better by having these conversations that's you know 10 out of 10 for my supervisor if, if it, when he listens back to this I can uh, oh yeah I'll, I'll get my beer I'll uh, I'll get him a coke that's probably more <laughs> but an extra listener for us that's what we're after yes yeah <laughs> so I very offhandedly at the start of this mentioned that you were previously a teacher um so I have I mean, I've got a few questions, but we'll stick to two questions about that. Firstly, what made you change your pathway from being a teacher to to doing science? And secondly, what do you think being a teacher allowed you to bring into being a scientist? Because obviously there's a lot of overlap, but I think I imagine there's some stuff you've brought to your PhD. So there's, uh, I can give quick, short answers to the first one and slightly longer for the second. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I was a chemistry teacher before and it was lots of fun to try and, a lot of kids, I, I, I had high school kids, a lot of kids are interested in science, but they don't actually know what science is. Like for a lot of people, science is just memorizing facts that are to do with chemistry, biology or physics. But the hardest thing to teach someone is a scientist's mindset of, you know, like investigation and kind of rational thinking, all these things. I was trying to teach these kids that. And I realized I love it. I love doing it. I love being, I love doing science and and being a scientist. It's the most fun. I was trying, you know, it's trying to explain to my little sister to convince her into science. Unfortunately, I didn't get her. But I'm trying to say like, it's so much fun. And in, in explaining how much fun it was to people, I realized I wanted to do it like I and so I kind of moved in and applied for and thankfully got my master's and then PhD in terms of what it brought there's a short comprehensive answer which is if you look if anyone if anyone's interested because it's a good resource to learn from um if you google the the teaching standards I think back in the day there were eight of them they might have changed now um but there's there's eight teaching standards which break down what makes a good teacher and five or six of them are still really applicable to scientists Things like differentiation and and which is again kind of which every one of us does without realizing you you give different information based on who you speak to. So if I'm talking if I'm talking with my PI about something, we can give really nitty gritty intricate details and protocols because we're trying to work out what the very best way of doing something is. If I'm explaining it to an undergrad, uh, I'm going to start with what they need to know, and then once they've gotten that, I'll kind of work my way up. Stuff like that is is really obvious and easy. But um, in doing the teaching, you you meet a lot of different kids and you meet a lot of different kind of learning styles and mindsets, and you learn how to speak to them and you 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 kind of as time goes on, you you kind of work out how to communicate a lot better because you're not just, again, for example, if I'm in the department, I'm communicating to quite a niche group of people, people who are in academic science at quite a high level. And sometimes you go and do a public engagement event or something like that, and you can end up just flopping so hard because you learn how to communicate with a very select group. But when you've got everyone in, in school, you've got everyone from really keen learners who, you there are some kids you can tell they're gonna go on and do really good stuff. And there are some kids you can tell that they are not academically gifted, but they can still enjoy science as well. And if you can learn to teach them in a way that they like, you can teach anyone and and you can then communicate with anyone. That's kind of, that's what I brought most Mm. over is being able to work out. It also, it doubles up in the writing process. What am I trying to say? What is the most efficient way of trying to say this to the audience I'm trying to say it to? I think that's one of the most important skills that a lot of scientists unfortunately don't have is there's so many people cannot adapt what they're saying to different audiences which is why we're on the whole so bad at outreach because we go yeah. in thinking they're at the same level and they've got all the understanding that we spent 10 years getting 
and nobody has that. Nobody outside your field has that. In fact, often nobody outside your lab has that. So it's, I, did my, I did my teacher training with, we had a chemist, we had two physicists, we had a biologist um, and uh, an ambulance technician who kind of was, is also a biologist of, of, of sorts. And every one of us, super excited, we're watching lessons and you get to go and do it and you flop so hard for the first couple of months. It's, it's, it's soul destroying. But it's because that's that is the crucible. That's your kind of learning mm-hmm. process. But a lot of people in who have never who haven't gone through teacher training or anything like that, your first public engagement, that's going to be your flop or your, you know, not necessarily people do do real. But I've had the opportunity to fail so much more and I have failed so much more than a lot of academic scientists. Um, so if you can if you can kind of bring that and, and thankfully, we've got a really good academic outreach team in Edinburgh. And so when people have got kind of outreach events, the team works with them to make sure it's done properly. But th- the worry is that sometimes if people flop hard like that, they then don't want to do it again. Yeah. It's like, no, you, like this just happens. You just need to learn to fail. Like it, it, life is just hard sometimes, but like I, I guarantee you that the next time you do it, someone's going to learn something and like both of you will enjoy it. Yeah, I agree. We don't get a lot of opportunities to necessarily practice that either as scientists you don't really it's not built into phd programs and then when you do it you t- it's often you do it once a year if that yeah. and you're kind of just thrown into it so i'll wrap up with coming back to the edinburgh open research initiative because i think that's something that we should really be trying to promote as well because it fits out well with what we do here so could you just explain a little bit more about what that is and why it's good and why really we should probably have one for every city i think I definitely, I definitely agree. We should. Um, so effectively, there's a bunch of us um, who think that science could be done better. Science is done in a really closed way, as I'm sure that the, your, your listeners will know, because again, we're a kind of niche audience. That science is mostly done closed, and that actually just isn't very good for science itself. It's it's not the best system. It's I mean, you can get into philosophical arguments about taxpayers are paying for bad science and all these things, but at the core of it science is done poorly if it's done closed so we kind of we started the initiative as a way of just at very least getting the information out there and we're not going to force people like all you can ever all you can ever do is tell people and if they want to do it they do and if they don't want to they don't um so we kind of share all the benefits of it we we share the fact that you'll get increased citations over a period of time if you preprint compared to if you don't We share all these different kind of facts and figures and papers. And we share that, like, if you're looking for a publication, doing a registered report means it will get published, even if it doesn't turn out the way you want. And instead of doing a two-year research kind of endeavor, only to then find out that it's quote unquote or negative data and therefore won't get published. But arguably, and and again, the kind of the, the philosophy that we stick to, it doesn't really matter if data is negative or positive. What matters is if it's conclusive. And so we're trying to get the idea out there that like, look, open your science out to people, let people, first off, fingers crossed, people find stuff you're doing wrong, because then you can do stuff better. But what we try and do is is share a bunch of resources, share around awareness. We've got various talks and things like that. We've got a conference that's being organized. I say we, but as I say, it's been passed on to others. So I've I've got to give a big shout out to the, the current guys behind the Edinburgh Open Research Initiative. The vast majority of people we chat to and we talk to about open science, it's not that they have been, they've known it for years and they're just trying not to get away with it. They just don't know. Like a lot of people just aren't aware. And once you kind of talk through it to people, it just becomes, people say, oh yeah, like that's, that's a really good idea. We should do that. I agree. Like we know (laughs) that's like, that's why we're here. COVID turned a lot of people onto preprints in particular. So that hopefully we've boosted that well the COVID had you know it's had a positive boost mm. and that that has helped a lot and I, I've been really lucky for the past couple of years to work with some of the big people in the open access field so preprints get more citations that's uh, Nick Fraser who was first author on my COVID work and the, the, one of the things I think I like the most about the open access area and the people in that field is they're all really nice they are some of the nicest people you will ever sit down and talk to in science because all yeah. they want to do is make science better for everyone and they're not, they're not pushy people. They'll just tell you, here are the facts. They make your life better. So why aren't you doing it? And then just as you did there, when people say, yeah, actually, I should be doing that. We get all excited about it. <laughs> We've got another one. That's the plan. Exactly. That's the, the cult is growing. That's all we want. So my, my supervisor's got quite a good presentation he gives on impact factors and why they're completely pointless and meaningless mm. and should be discarded. And I, if you Google Will Cawthorn 
open science or impact factor. All of his slides are online. You can find them with all the facts and references and stuff like that. But he's he's kind of analogized it that he it, uh, it's not his analogy, but it's one that he's got in the presentation that the current incentive for impact factors and, and the way science is done is if radio songs were judged on how many plays they get in the first two weeks after they're released. Mm. And the, and the I, I can't remember who it is the, the, the quote originally comes from, but the point made is that all that you'd end up with is really jingoistic kind of like slappy, almost Christmas style music in that is really, really popular, but doesn't actually mean anything or have any profound impact. And that isn't, and that it's a very cynical way of looking at it because again, as we say, you look at a lot of papers that are done really, really well. And it's even now, like, especially nowadays with like the way that technology has come along, you there's questions that you could never answer before. And it's the most impressive thing to see questions answered like that. But the whole time the, it, you're being incentivized not to produce good science. You're being incentivized to produce popular science and it's crushing. Yeah, it is. but I think that's a really good point to end on. Hopeful and cynical, which is me all over. <laughs> that was really, that was great. I... That was a really good chat. You are definitely one of the best speakers I think we've had on, and you made my job easy, which is... Say that to all the girls, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad I, I was worried. I just, a few times I caught myself rambling, so I kind of clamped. John sorts through all the rambling. He loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Ideal. All right. Thank you so much. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows.